Now, uh, Africa is, in Africa, probably uh, what introduced us to it previously it was women who are brewing. I don't know what happened, and then men took over. But then finally, women are reclaiming their rightful position in the craft alcohol industry. Now, I'll want to introduce the next person. This is a person who is very well versed in the craft beer industry. If you follow it, you probably know her. Her name is Apiwe Nusani Mawele. She is the founder of Tolokazi Beer from South Africa. Let's welcome Apiwe to the stage. The very lovely Apiwe with a very flowery African dress. Now, next on stage, I want to invite one of the ladies that is actually driving the craft beer revolution in Africa, in Rwanda. This lady, she's called Jessie. She's very warm. She started this thing as a home, a home thing. She was a home brewer. She was doing it at home, and then people liked it. And then she was like, if people like it, they can also pay me to do it, right? So Jessie decided to start her own a brewery, it's called Queza Brewery in Rwanda and it's expanding. So, Jess, Jesse, please come on stage. <laughs> Jesse comes from the same village with Owen. <laughs> she told me they might be related, probably. So <laughs> Finally, uh, we have the lady who is taking the craft alcohol in Kenya by storm. You've probably drunk her products if you are in this room, and if you haven't, they are readily available somewhere here. Now, this lady is called Alex. I would want her to probably say her names properly. Alex, please welcome on stage. She's the founder and CEO of African Originals. I think I've given them a very befitting welcome to the stage. So I'll leave this now to Dr. John to actually take over and tell us more about the craft alcohol industry in Africa. Dr. John, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is uh, John Moria. I work at J Quart. I am a lecturer there. I manage the Food Technology Center there, and I do research. But other than that, I have worked for Kenya breweries for nine years, and lastly before my last po as a brewmaster and uh, as a chemist. And, pra and uh, before coming to j -Quart, I was the corporate staff brewer for Miller Coors Corporation, which owned uh, eight breweries all over the U.S. in several cities, several states, each of them with about, about 1,000 people. And we also had several microbreweries. I worked very hard with the Blue Moon and other microbreweries. So I do have some... Uh, I'm a brewmaster, so I do have credentials on that direction. But this is not about me. It's about these people who are changing the landscape of the food industry, uh, of the microbrewery industry. I'm glad it is catching on here because in many other countries, every town has several microbreweries. They brew at the back. They have a restaurant at the front, and you have a microbrew. And it is they are going to change the Kenyan scene as we go along. As I said, uh, Apiwe, I, I have to say what, how she told me to say. So I said it, Apiwe, Sani, Sani. <laughs> she runs a microbrewery of about 1,000 1, uh, 1, liters. And Owen also, I have visited his brewery without him being there because one of my former students who did wine with me is, is what works for, for him. And then... Uh, the craft brewery in uh, Rwanda is going. They have IPAs there, amber ales. And uh, Owen told me to say he makes sand trap and IPAs and muratatu. And uh, Alexandra, she makes ciders, tonics, and iced teas. Now, we are, we are going to talk about um, the challenges and the opportunities that we have in Kenya. And this, I would let you take as much time as you may take living time for other people, what are the opportunities and challenges that you find in the microbrewery industry? You can start. Sure. Hello? Well, for us, um, with 254, um, we started about uh, five years ago. And from an entrepreneur's perspective, you always view 
the opportunity. Uh, we, I don't think we really realized the challenge at the time. You know, EABL has a 94% uh, market share in, in Kenya. So I'd say we underestimated uh, the, the challenges. Um, the, the, the licensing was the first uh, major hurdle uh, for us. It took us two years to get uh, a brewing license. We have uh, 12 departments of, of government in Kenya that uh, control brewing. Um, and uh, they don't all uh, speak the same language all the time. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, and, and, and as, you're, as you're going through that process, you can see kind of, of, of why EBL has, has uh, such a huge uh, monopoly. A lot of the laws have been written over the last 100 years to, uh, it's very kind of prohibitive for small brewers. So like one of the laws is like your, your bottling line must have a minimum capacity of 10,000 liters per hour, you know, <laughs> and that's what we produce in a month, you know. Um, so, so you can see that uh, there, there's a lot of challenges getting just to get into the game. Then when you're in, you, s you start to discover uh, that the how much really control EABL has with uh, with trade, you know, and they have such close relationships with um, vast vast majority of of the bars in Kenya, and then finally you have the challenge of of consumers who maybe haven't heard of uh, craft beers and it's more expensive and why would I pay more so. Uh, we, we deal with many, many challenges, and uh, I think probably for me, had I known the challenges in, in the beginning, we might have never started, but, you know, that's the, the blind optimism of the entrepreneur is, uh, views all those challenges as opportunities, because if, if one company has 94% market share, there's surely, there is uh, a huge latent demand for choice and, and alternative products. And being a small brewery, and we make a new beer every week, uh, we get so much uh, uh, consumer feedback and we have so much flexibility and, and ability to, to make new recipes and try new styles. Um, and that's what's really like exciting. So it's, it's two sides of the same coin, opportunity and, and challenge. And Owen. Yeah. Owen. Owen, oh, that is a situation in Kenya, a lot of controls and all that. I think we would like, I would like to hear the South African perspective for microbreweries. Uh, first, I would like to greet everyone. Uh, it's actually my first time in uh, Kenya, so it's been uh, great to see the craft scene, the side. Uh, coming from South Africa, we, we are a bit ahead of, um, in the continent. Um, before COVID, we had 200, over 200 uh, craft breweries across the country, um, mainly in the Western Cape, which is where Cape Town is, and a few in Johannesburg. Uh, so I own um, a brewery um, in Johannesburg. Uh, I think the challenges are very similar, uh, you know, when it comes to licensing. When I was opening my brewery, it took me eight months, at least not two years. Uh, I think maybe we have progressed slightly. Uh, we, within the government institutions, they've started defining what is the micro manufacturer. Um, you know, when you want to apply for a license, it's sort of there's some laws in place um, of where you can go, how you can do it. Um, there's been a few people that have opened breweries before, and uh, which makes things a little bit easier uh, for most of us. Uh, but I think the challenges uh, across the continent are still very similar i mean we are all we across all the countries uh, we have the same players all having majority share so we always um you know starting from a from a very low base and and convincing consumers who have not traveled much that there is more to beer than just a lager um, that there is something called an ipa there's something called an ember ale and, and obviously then the price point um, that um, the beer will be more expensive and having to explain why it is more expensive. So I think from South Africa, those are some probably one of the top challenges. So uh, I would like to... <laughs> this, so I'd like to hear how it is in Rwanda, whether you are allowed, I know there's a lot of restrictions in Kenya, 
about microbreweries using malt uh, from Bali. Can you tell us the situation in uh, Rwanda, whether they are allowed to use malted uh, barley, or can they import, or what is the situation like Rwanda? Tell us from your perspective. Um, so we are the first br first craft brewery in Rwanda. Um, so I think like these guys, the figuring out what the regulations are for a craft brewery has been an obstacle. Um, but the, the malt situation is interesting because it's we're allowed to use the malt, we're allowed to import. Um, there is no commercial malting facility in the country to buy from, so we have to import if we want to use malted barley. The problem is that if we make our beer with imported ingredients, we pay 60% excise tax on that beer, plus 18% VAT. So 78 cents on the dollar is going back to the government, and that's just not financially viable for us to, to operate. Um, the government is very, 81% of Rwandans rely on agriculture for their livelihood. So the government has a lot of policies to really encourage buying local products and using agro-processing. Um, so what we've done is um, our beer is majority sorghum. So we traditionally, Rwandans make ichigaje. It's, a, um, it's made from sorghum and it's malted. So most farms, the, the mama on the farm is malting sorghum to make home brew. So what we've started with is sourcing from those mamas and that's what then we do, then we've created a process that creates more of a clear beer out of that. So it's kind of, a traditional ingredient, but with modernized taste. Um, and so now what we're looking into is just bringing that process in-house just for quality control and aflatoxin concerns. Um, so, so the malt is, is allowed, but not financially viable. So we're back to you know, using local products, which is also one of our values, is to source as locally as possible. Why would you come to Rwanda or be in Rwanda and want a German beer, right? Like, let's enjoy something that's from Rwanda um, and from Africa. Sorghum is native to the area, so why would we not be using it as a base ingredient? So we, we, we will take a different twist with Alexandra. Alexandra, is, she's making uh, ciders. For those people who may not know the definition, a cider is made from apples, and uh, so she's got, she has to tell us whether she has a cidery. Like you have a brewer, you have a cidery, but she's got different twists. She's got tonics and iced teas. Thanks, John. Um, so as John said, I make cider, but I also make um, spirits. Um, so some of the similar challenges um, that everyone else has had in terms of licensing, um, especially for cider. Uh, to start off with. I even actually started a snack brand whilst I was waiting for my license to come through. Um, but actually it's been incredibly hard for spirits. Um, spirits, we are uh, one of the only few in Kenya, uh, with three of us now, who are um, distilling a finished product legally uh, to sell um, in Kenya. And so obviously that's a, a new path to be trodden on. And I think um, paving that way was very interesting and a little bit leaning to what Owen was saying. I think just the concept and the licensing is very much geared towards automation and, and huge volumes, which obviously goes against any craft product. Uh, so that's one of the biggest challenges we faced. Um, another one for, for me, I, I think you know, our focus has been uh, around creating original products. So how do we create products that aren't in market for the moment and are about delivering against a need state that's unmet by the consumer for the moment. So, you know, with the ciders, we really wanted something that was sweet and strong, like Muratina, um, but legal and quality and made with real fruit. Um, so, so with that in mind, um, we actually started trying to make it and realized that no one in this country knows how to make it, so it was just me and I'm not very good. Um, so uh, I think the, the fundamental challenge I've had is, is really talent. There's tons of talent in this country, but it's just skill set. So if you're trying to do something new, uh, you're the first to do it. And so uh, figuring that out with your team and training everyone and bringing more people on board to come and do original products 
it, it's something that we, we continue to face, uh, especially in distillation now. I have a similar challenge, uh, an awesome, very tight, small team, but we're growing phenomenally and um, we, we can't actually get the talent trained up fast, en fast enough in time. Uh, I, I switch to ask now. Uh, I think what we would do, the best thing is to open up for questions, interest, the beer types. There are so many types of beers. And as I say, the microbreweries, especially in the US, every town you go, they are making beer at the back. They got their local, local style over there. Interesting beers. And if you have had beers like wheat beers, pale ales, Indian pale ales, Amber Ales is making Indian pale ales and all that. Whatever questions you want to ask these people, you can go ahead and ask. And I don't know whether somebody has a microphone so that we can open. I think it's more interesting if we open up for questions. My name is Claire, a student from JQuart. I had a question regarding um, consumer interest with um, legitness of your beers or liquors, spirits, etc. So when you, you've already like um, manufactured the spirit, then bottled it, distributed it, and it's in the supermarkets, malls, or the wines and spirits, which are local. But then um, how are you able to assure the customers that it's legit? Like when you go to some wines and spirits, they have like um, people at the back who are like, making their own spirits and then they'll wash the bottles that have already been used to take the liquor and after washing it they fill it up with extra spirits so you as a consumer and then you go and buy it it's something different it's labeled this but when you take it it's completely different and not i think I, i'll rephrase that question i think you are talking about illegal manufacturers who would actually be making things and fitting from the back so what you are asking is, when they make their stuff, how do they make sure that people are not using their bottles and their stuff so that uh, the people don't get contaminated or somehow that effect? Sorry. Um, so I don't think we've reached the point yet where people are making fake uh, 254 bottles. Uh, so when, but, but you'll get there, we'll get there eventually. That will be a, another landmark when, when people are making knockoffs, you know you've, you've really made it, you know? <laughs> um, but I don't think we're there yet. And I think Kenya's answer to that has been with the excise stickers. And they, they must be on the caps of the, the bottles. And so if, if, if someone's removed the cap and filled it with something else, and put the cap back on, you will, you'll be able to see that that sticker's been tampered with. So that's, that's kind of what we have at the moment for protection against the counterfeits. So I can just add to that on the spirits, because I think this is quite a prevalent one. I mean, I used to work uh, for Pernod Ricard, and um, Jameson had a big counterfeit problem in this market. Uh, and it really hit the, the brand. So it is very top of mind for me on spirits. Um, so what we do with, with Five Eights, which is um, our, our entry level gin, um, is uh, we have a guala cap, which is basically, a, it's an anti, has an anti-counterfeit valve, but it is also um, means that you can't kind of reseal after, or you can't refill, sorry, uh, after you've um, opened it. So that's our major, protection for spirits and particularly because we've just launched a, a 350 mil which is a smaller format obviously that in terms of availability and and who's going to be consuming that uh, opens things up to counterfeit so it is uh, fairly top of mind but there are solutions out there for it so do we have more questions uh, some what is anybody with the mic I will try to rephrase it, but if you ask, ask the way it can be understood, I, I will not rephrase. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David. I'm a rock guy, I'm an electrical guy, I'm not in your field. And um, I would like to post a question. You guys coming from a different field from where I come from, I'm a process-based uh, developer, a local person. But I'll push that aside a little. 
I have an interesting argument because one of my relative or a close person to me is able to develop some of these uh, products you guys are advancing to our local market. However, at the exit of the university, there's a lot of potential with the uh, students. But it's very, very hard for them to step into the industry. Personally, I have someone who is very immediate to me who has developed, patented a product in brewing industry. My question is, do you give a provision whereby you can participate with them so that they're able to come over with the patent, partner with you, so that instead of that potential being wasted, it should be fruitful even if there should be some commercial arrangement. Do you normally open the door for such? That's my main interest. I think I'll answer that question because I've been in the business for a long time. This is business, and business is about money. And if you come with a proposition that works for both people and you meet them and they see something that is going to bring money, they will, a business person is a business person. They will definitely partner with you. So that's all I can say. If it works and it's a business proposition and it's good, now you are meeting them, that's why we have these kind of meetings, and you approach them and you have something that works, I'm sure nobody refuses a business proposal that is going to make money. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Manasses. I'm a quality assurance read at Wedge Hut. Mine is to that lady on the far. And I was to ask, uh, I have students who have been contacting me in my emails. They want to know, they have been believing uh, personal projects on their side hustles, but they want to know, can you help them uh, develop further, the do further tests, and also help them do good write-ups? Not a matter of doing business, rather, than uh, also utilizing uh, other products that are not being utilized. For example, apple waste, which can be fermented into good final products. So do you help on such students to make the, their dreams come true about product development and also utilization of waste? Thank you so much. I really don't want to take every question, but I was asked by a student like my, another student who asked me, how can I use mango waste to make wine? And now you have talked about apple waste. Let me just get off. I've been in brewing for over 26 years. Nobody wants sub-premium ingredients in their wine. Wine is a premium drink. So I would request the person who is using the apple waste to stop using the apple waste, take the apple, and make a cider. Because if I go to a bar and I got my own money in my pocket, I'm not going to be asking for an apple cider or some drink that is made with apple waste. I want to spend some money and enjoy myself. So let's just start off on the right crowd, but let, if anybody else has an answer, yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, but in terms of uh, the first piece, which I, I had understood as training, um, uh, and having your students, we, we very much welcome people to come to the site. I think it's part of the joy of craft to, to get people to see how we make it. And there's no uh, hiding away from that. So, and we really, you know, for us, we see that as a future talent pipeline, really. And um, actually next year, we have a small objective on doing a little uh, distillation school. Um, so we have a tiny 50 liter still as well as our main 600 liter still. Um, and really the idea is to, to bring people over and teach them a little bit about distillation, some tasting as well, um, uh, and really with the emphasis of hopefully getting people excited about the industry and the space to, to, to come and, uh, and produce for us one day. Um, so in answer to your first question, yes. In terms of the second question, didn't quite get it. I think it was around waste. I'm very intrigued by waste overall though. Um, we have a lot of fruit waste from our cider. Uh, so actually, we've been playing around with how we can ferment it uh, to, to make other uh, products. Uh, it's not something we'll do tomorrow, but it's definitely something we're open to playing around with and, and, and embrace anyone who wants to explore that with us. Hello. Uh, recently, we have seen that the government has 
put our war on alcohol. And we've also seen some leaders encouraging the youth to move away from alcohol consumption. But, and we've also seen some, some legal breweries being crossed down because of alcohol. And uh, my question is, is the government describing your products as alcohol, alcohol, or, and what has been your encounter with the government? I, I am not sure. Could Can you, you restate take that? More? Can you yes. restate it? Restate it. Restate <laughs> right. that question, please. Uh, the question is about the recent government onslaught on uh, alcohol, uh, especially in the central region, I believe. So the, he, he wants to like get the from the from their side. What is the interaction in the government when it comes to legislation now? I think the government. You go take it. Well. Um, so the alcohol in Kenya is taxed on a per liter basis uh, rather than a percentage of, of costs. Um, so uh, in, in theory, uh, craft, uh, pro craft uh, beers, craft ciders, gins, etc., would have a small advantage over a cheaper mass market product because it's a higher value per liter. So if it's a per liter tax, then it's a, it's a lower percentage of um, the, the finished product, but it doesn't really work that way because really the taxes in Kenya is so high. And this is before the current administration. Um, you know, in the case of beer, the tax on beer in Kenya is, is it's about 200, it's over 200 times higher than the tax on beer in Germany. You know, so um, we kind of feel like the the tax code for alcohol is, uh, is a little bit uh, antiquated, uh, a little bit broken. About 50% of alcohol in Kenya pays no tax, you know, is uh, all outside of the tax uh, bracket in form of illicit uh, alcohol. And, and main, one of the main drivers for that is because the tax is so high. So um, high tax on, on beer will drive people to spirits and high tax on beer and spirits will drive people to illicit uh, markets. So uh, we definitely try to be engaged with the government. Our brewery is in Kikuyu. We're very much, you know, um, part of central Kenya and, and understand the, the issues, um, in particular with young men and alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, and, you know, um, my feeling on it is really that uh, the tax code should be at some point uh, kind of uh, restructured so that it doesn't really drive everyone to these um, illicit drinks and, and drugs which are really very, very dangerous. So uh, we'll kind of say for the current government that w our craft products are the lesser of two evils. If you think alcohol is evil, which of course I believe alcohol is a gift from God, but, you know, I do too. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit biased, you know. I think we would, I would like to hear about the taxation in South Africa and how we can borrow from your examples over there. Um, so in South Africa, we actually have a very different uh, taxation rules where we are taxed on um, per litre alcohol. So the, um, the beer, because it's a uh, lower alcohol average, uh, we're sitting at about 5% alcohol compared to spirits, which are like 43%. So our tax rate is, is, is much lower. However, uh, as a craft brewer, there is no real advantage compared to the mass produced because um, it's not about the volume. So that's something that um, we actually threw, because I sit in the Beer Association of South Africa and the Craft Brewers Association of South Africa, where we've actually engaged government to, um, to look at um, take changing some of the laws so that it favors uh, small producers like in most other countries. Uh, and that way we actually able to create more jobs. Um, we're able to um, allow more new entrants into the industry and uh, it, it's better for, for everyone. So we're still fighting those battles. And Rwanda? Um, I think I mentioned earlier the 60% excise tax or the 30% depending on if your local ingredients are imported. Um, and that is based on sale price. Um, and so Rwanda is set up for the, the giant commercial breweries. 
And so it's the percentage of sale price at their, when it leaves X factory. So when they sell it to their distributor, we, as a craft brewer, you know, that sale point is you. So if you come to take a Quasar beer, I pay 30% or 60% of that sale price to you. So we're essentially like our bartenders, everybody's salaries get included in excise tax. So the nice part is Rwanda's government, while they don't currently have anything set up for craft breweries, are open to it. So currently they've recommended that we just create another business. So we'll have the brewery that then sells to our distribution company so that the taxation point, there's a, there's a taxation point that is fair. They, you know, they've said, the, the law, was, the way that it is written, is for big commercial breweries. So, um, so we're just trying to structure ourselves so that we can be compliant, but not it, go under in terms of paying too much tax. Um, we are working with other agencies in the Rwandan government to propose a new tax code. Um, there's, a, there's us as a craft brewery, there's a few craft distilleries. You know, the craft alcohol movement is growing, um, and the government is very open to it. Um, and and they, they want it to be a growing industry. So we're just engaged with them to try to write those laws um, in a way that's beneficial to the country in terms of taxes for the country, but also allows a business to operate. If there are more questions, we don't want to cut them out, so. Okay, thank you for that. Um, my name is Anita Jorotich. I work with Diajo. Um, my question to the panel is, uh, we know that COVID came, we saw the consumer trends and everything else after COVID, so I don't know how you're faring with the, tr the, the current setup. After COVID, or during COVID, people are taking more of spirits than the beers, so I don't know, is there a change post-COVID? And then what is the future of uh, the beers and the craft beers in general? with the Gen Z. I can see there's a lot of Gen Zs here. And we know for them, they like something that they take once and they get high. Something like a higher alcohol percentage. What is the future for that, for you guys? Thank you. I think the question, if I understand it, is about trends. What are the beer trends, and we can address this panel. Are people now tending more to spirits, now before COVID and post COVID, and because they are tending more to the heavier beers, which the craft brewers tend to be heavier, when you look at it, and I suppose you work for East African breweries, right? So what is the trade? Because when you go to a bar, uh, the Gen Z, as she's saying, taking more of the spirits of the beer before and after coffee, or however you want to slice it. Um, <laughs> well, um, I think, you know, if you work for Diageo, you have much more visibility on trends than I do. Uh, I'm looking at a tiny uh, a, a sliver of the market. Actually, I was speaking with someone from Diageo last week. She told me that from 2020 to now, um, the, the, the split of it, it used to be like 80-20 uh, beer to spirits, and it's, it's almost like 50-50 now, you know? Um, so definitely, there's been a rise in, in spirits. Part of that may be driven by COVID because it was easier to, to store spirits at home. Um, I think um, part of it is also tax, you know, because beer is taxed in Kenya 3.5 times higher per unit of alcohol than spirits. So it's going to drive, you know, consumer behavior is going to end up gravitating to spirits. Also, spirits, because of cocktails, you know, it's, you have so much variability. From one spirit, you can make uh, a thousand different cocktails. And I think cocktails are, w certainly we see, we, we, uh, we have two bars as well as the brewery, and definitely we see like, um, we have to have a, our cocktail game has to be uh, tight, you know? Uh, people, and, and people are r willing to pay uh, like 900 shillings for a cocktail, you know? Uh, so the, the willingness to pay is higher and the tax is lower. So I think that's the direction that uh, uh, it's going. So Alex is much smarter than me making gin. I don't know why I'm making beer, but uh, maybe she has some more insights on it. Um, 
so I, I will just exp um, answer in terms of the trends from South Africa side. Um, so we, in Africa, we follow, obviously you guys know, American trends and the, and the European trends a lot. Uh, and we, within, within the craft beer industry, we follow mainly the uh, um, uh, American trends. So in South Africa, we at the point where, um, in terms of the beer and the beer styles, we're exploring more beer styles, which are, uh, I find more attractive to the younger generation. So things like milkshake IPA is a big thing. I don't understand why. <laughs> um, things like sour beers. So you're starting to uh, tap into different palates. Um, and that is, I think, is going to continue to grow. We're going to start seeing more people who are maybe not necessarily beer drinkers being enticed into beer based on the different beer styles that are existing and we are starting to make. And that trend is also starting to trickle into the rest, um, from South Africa to the rest of the continent. And I think that's a trend um, that I've noticed and I think that's going to continue. And there's also another big one is localization. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we, we couldn't source a lot of things, so we had to start using what we have. So you're starting to see a lot of that. We, um, in, in South Africa specifically, we're using a lot of sorghum in the brewing, where previously we used to make German beer styles, we used to make a lot of American beer styles. People now are starting to look at, you know, what, um, what grains can I use, what herbs can I use, uh, is there any local yeast I can use so that I can start uh, making local ingredients, uh, local beers. And you find that a lot of the young people um, are more excited about such things more than the older generation, so we're doing a lot of, there's a lot to look out for. I don't know, your side? Um, since we're the first craft brewery, it's hard to follow a trend. We are the trend. <laughs> um, the choices currently are industrial lager or industrial lager. Um, and so, but what we are seeing is as we start to produce beers is that People just want variety. They want something new. Um, you know, some people want kind of a stepping stone. They call it the beer beer. You know, like where is our version of an industrial lager? Um, but, you know, playing with Saison's, playing with mango beers, playing with different, different beers, it all has interest. We expected by now to have one real kind of flagship thing that's selling more than others. But every time we're like, oh, this one's going to be the, the trending one. People just turn around, they're like, now I like this one. So I think that, you know, that's the advantage of a craft brewery is we can follow the trends. Um, so that's, that's a lot of kind of the fun of craft beer. Um, and then I think opposite what I think a lot of people are mentioning, we're actually finding a request for lower alcohol beer. Um, so even like I came up with a ginger beer during lockdown, it was originally about 8% and everyone's like, no, 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 lower, 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 lower. Um, most of our beers come in between 4.2 and 4.5% alcohol and that seems to be where the, the Rwandan audience really wants it. Um, it is, we are a very strict country, so there's very strict drunk driving rules, for example. People want to take a couple of beers and know that, they're, that they won't be over limit. Um, and also there's just a general health consciousness. There's, you know, people aren't necessarily going out just to get wasted. Um, and so people want to enjoy the beverages, and so they're actually coming to us and saying, can you create this but lower alcohol? Um, and there's a lot of interest. We're going into more the non-alcoholic beverages also. Um, so I think that in, there's a lot of requests for um, low sugar kind of natural sodas. So we're, we're working with the protected areas, for example, like the mention of local products. What are the fruits and, and different flavors that are available? You know, Rwanda's in a biodiversity hotspot on the face of the earth. Um, what fruits and things grow in these forests that we can actually put on a seltzer or put something so that it's a unique beverage um, that isn't as sugary as your kind of average sodas um, and also is something completely unique to Rwanda that can be drunk within the country and used as an export. Um, we are seeing a lot of of requests from abroad for products from Rwanda um, and just wanting unique things. So within and outside, I think people just want new things um, and going more of a, a health trend from what we're getting demand for. Thanks. Um, so I guess these guys are doing such a good job on beer. So that's why um, we said, look, let's focus on what we call like near beer. So anything but beer. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the defining things on looking at the categories that we'll play in um, was just looking at where is there less choice in the market. Um, so one of the things that we focused on for cider 
was this sort of getting in the mood for the night out. Um, you don't want like necessarily heavy spirits to kick off the night necessarily, but you do want something that's going to warm you up. And that's why our, our, our ciders are sweet. They're also strong. They're 8%, but they're not 20%. So, um, so that's kind of an area we've sort of focused on with the, with the ciders. Um, the other thing I would say on cider is really flavor. I think one key, whether it's a trend or an insight, is more that we've seen that people really want strength of flavor, they want quality of flavor, but they don't actually, for us, want complexity of flavor. Anyway, our audience, they want to know it's pineapple or that it's passion. Um, so we've really tried to slim, simplify and, and strip down some of that stuff so it's very clearly, okay, this is passion on the nose. Um, and then in spirits, you know, there is a huge growth trend that you were talking about and this switch that Owen was talking about. I think in terms of growth, though, when you split it down, where is the growth coming from? It's coming from premium spirits. Uh, I'm still qualifying premium or standard to premium. Um, uh, uh, and um, so I think, you know, we, we know that people are starting to care more about quality. How people define quality is very different based on the audience. So quality to one person might just be like, I know there are real ingredients, or it tastes better and is smoother. So they'll value that over price, and that is still valuing quality over price. So we're seeing people more and more um, right through from like 1,400 shillings on a 750 mil bottle caring about this. So I think that's um, an interesting piece. And we're, really, uh, we're also playing around with uh, super premium. So we've just launched a, a, a range of limited edition gins and they are, um, they're, they're paying on this piece on single flavor. So um, a cacao gin or a pineapple gin, uh, but they're at 57% ABV, very strong call it navy strength um, and, uh, and, and it's a bit of fun really. Uh, it's not going to be huge, it's never going to be a huge size of opportunity that, um, but, it, but it's, a, it's a way to innovate and we do see people uh, showing interest in that and, and learning about the product that way. This topic was about opportunities and challenges and I look down there, I see some of them are students, some are former, of my former students, and they would like to own something or do something. So I'm gonna ask this panel, from a futuristic sense, to put on their crystal ball and see the trends in five, 10, 20 years, whatever. Um. Actually, uh, Piwe, you just reminded me when you're talking about South Africa, and uh, that was my impression in South Africa as well. Like, it's a lot of following American and European trends. Uh, I think in Kenya, there's a potential, like, KO is a great example, um, but even 254, we, we are driven more by Kenyan, uh, you know, uh, taste preferences. So, like, we make a new beer every week in, in Kikuyu, and it's like the winners kind of uh, get made again, and, and it's very like consumer driven. So we're not, of course, we're looking at US trends and like we'll make a milkshake IPA and, and, and see what it tastes like and what the fuss is all about. Um, but like one of our most popular beers is, is Muratatu, it's a Belgian triple, uh, it's 10.4%, and it has a very similar taste profile with Muratina. And, you know, I would have never predicted when we started that um, the, a Belgian triple would be one of our, our top selling beers, you know? Uh, but that was just purely, purely consumer driven, you know? And we put that beer on tap in Kikuyu, it was like the fermenter was finished in, in like two days, you know? Um, so I'm excited about that and I think that like as well as, as we look at the future and, and what's going on, we kind of hope that uh, as, as whatever, whatever changes are happening in the law in Kenya, um, I, I think it would be a very healthy thing as well for uh, traditional brewers to be, you know, uh, legalized, you know. Uh, traditional brewers today in Kenya are not allowed to brand 
or retail their, their products, you know. So there's a huge job opportunity if traditional brewers were allowed to actually be uh, entrepreneurs and develop businesses uh, like everybody else. Um, and anyway, I think that those flavor preferences uh, coming from those uh, traditional beers like Martina, Busan, Nazi, and so on, um, will play a role in the development of the flavors that are popular in craft. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's exciting and it's, a, it's an advantage of Kenya that it is more, um, it, it, it is more like South Africa definitely felt more like um, Americanized in the craft beer scene, you know? Yeah, let's take two minutes down the line. Thank you. Um, I think for me, one thing I just want to mention as part of the trends is uh, in the continent, we're seeing a lot of growth in, in craft brewing, and I see a lot of young people in the room. Um, like I said, in South Africa, we're sitting at 200, over 200 craft breweries. Uh, we've got craft breweries in Botswana, in Namibia. Uh, we've got craft breweries in, I mean, first in Rwanda. There's one opening in Burundi. There's about five in Kenya. There's ten, uh, Uganda has one, Tanzania has two you know, Nigeria, Ghana. Um, so for the young people in the room, I think uh, opportunities, the guys must look at the opportunities that exist, um, that the market is very much untapped. Um, you know, there's uh, not only from owning a brewery or owning a salary prime, but for working, because we're struggling to find qualified brewers. Um, I mean, your brewer is from Germany, I think. Your head brewer, yes. Uh, where you guys are sitting in this room, should be becoming head brewer at a Kenyan brewery. Um, and I think those are some of the things that I would want everyone in this room to start thinking about. How do we each participate in this growing industry? Um, we need farmers, we need to get hold of this barley, this sorghum, and these are people in this room that need to look at looking at such opportunities uh, from bottling um, to labels to marketing uh, and an end, I can, the list goes on. Um, and as the trends continue, we're gonna need people that are gonna help us, you know, continue with those trends. So, thank you. Um, I think somewhat following up on a PUA's point, beer originated in Mesopotamia and Egypt. It's not German guys that started making beer. Um, and so obviously I'm not African, but you know, I think what I want to help do in, in our role in craft beer is to be able to bring the attention back to this continent. Like this is where beer started. Um, and so that needs to be recognized, I think. And, and you know, people getting into the industry, it's, beer is a $555 billion global industry. Um, the statistics, at least from like the U US and Europe, are only 1% of breweries are black owned, 2% are female owned, so how do we start to diversify that market and make a bigger pie? You know, why do the breweries all get owned by German guys? Um, so how do we, I think there's real opportunity in just growing this field and diversifying it, creating more products, creating more types of businesses. It doesn't have to be just, can I make a commercial lager? Um, you know, what, what else is there? What products are here? What products can we make? Um, who's making them? Who's owning them? Um, I think that there's a lot of diversification and, and opportunity in this field. Cool, I think everyone said it all, but um, yeah, I think for me it would be the opportunity to make more things with unconventional African raw materials. I think that's the opportunity. Um, and I welcome anyone in this audience who wants to come and help us do it. I think I was given one hour and um, we are coming to one hour. Um, so I think this is it's a real pressure to have these people come and share their knowledge. And what will happen is when we meet next year or the other year or in five years, I'm sure somebody in here will be inspired, especially the young folk. That is our goal here, to educate, to inspire. When you go to a craft beer, ask what's an IPA? What is a wheat beer? What is an Indian pale ale? How, what is a bitterness? That kind of thing and try to create your own. There's nothing more than people like us when we, like when you see your students or you see people you mentor, go ahead and succeed. So this was for you and I think for the guy who gave me the mic, unless there's anything else, I think I, let me just say it took to one hour, unless there's a burning question. 
Yes, sir. Is there a burning question? Because I think our one hour has come to an end. Okay, I'm done. And thank you very much for the reasoning. Uh, you are a good audience. Check. Thank uh, you. Before they leave, just give us one, one, one question, and then you can leave. Okay, two. Oh, he was another question. Hello. Sorry, I, I'd like to maybe to in introduce myself once more. I'm David. I like the way you have presented, and I'm grateful for the work you are doing. And that is very grateful for helping us see the future, the processes. I didn't want to introduce what I do first, because the subject was about the products. This is not my area. But I have a point of uh, contribution. I am an, an electrical guy, and I'm ba I base my research on cottage industry development, the micro and small enterprises, especially with empowering the youth and um, women. When it comes to what you are talking about, the local beer, we know it's not in the shelves. Why? One, because of the standards and regulation. I would like to go back home and contribute to the women who are doing brewing. There are ladies who do the shanga around the river. I want to automate that process so that it raises to a standard. I would like to know whether it's, it's possible for me to maybe partner with you, develop this technology because I'm from electrical. I can develop the technology to make it more a standard hygiene from a local based solution for especially the young and the women so that we are able to build the industry even by our own self besides the product i'm not in the product but in the processes of manufacturing thank you you have a question okay. just a quick one i'm collins nyongesa i'm an electrical engineer i work in the dairy industry uh, just some three or two questions to Jesse and Apiwe. Uh, can Kenyans work for you? Because I believe one is from Rwanda and South Africa. What is the process for Kenyan engineers to come and work for you? For Chapet and uh, 254, do you guys have like internships for Kenyan students and uh, so that they may learn from you guys and what is the process. And also, coming from the rural area, I have not seen products for African originals, even 254. Uh, we have our products that we know, like the Changa, that the one you said, and Busa. How can you get your products back there in the rural area? Thank you. I think uh, anyone wants to give a a response to that, and then we finish. I wanted to give the one on Changa, because <laughs> we don't want to take it casually. Changa, that's the fashion of Waraji, but what they did, it goes through fractional distillation. When you do that mixed fermentation and distillation without fractional distillation, this is from a safety perspective, because we don't want to, we don't want to send information which can be not so good for your health. When you don't do fractional distillation after fermentation, and you get those multiple alcohols, you start with methanol, you got ethanol, you got pentanol, and higher alcohols like that, that is when the problem is there. That's why distillation has to be done by an expert who does it fractionally and removes the methanol and other ma harmful parts. And we have a distiller here, maybe she can add to that. Because that is very important for people to note from a health perspective. I mean, I, I think, you know, I totally empathize with, um, with the industry from that perspective. Uh, and we'd love to kind of find ways to support. Um, I think, you know, the way that we would love to support in the longer run is find ways to come and train and bring people to help uh, and, and give them jobs uh, at us, um, because I appreciate also, from a safety point of view, uh, there's a lot of um, history in this market um, and a lot of tension there. Um, but I'm very happy to, to speak after this and, and chat and see if there's a, an opportunity anyway. Um, but um, to John's point, in terms of 
uh, legalizing what, what is happening out there from a distillation, which is different to the, the brewing side of things. Um, there is a risk there. But w you know, what we would love to do in the long run is, is find more and more opportunities to, to help train on, on distillation uh, in the safe way. Um, which kind of brings me on to the other question. Um, we um, do have internships uh, in production. So we have two live internships for the moment. It's actually an always on. Uh, we have a distillation internship. And really, that's the, um, the opportunity to try and uh, build skill sets uh, and that and, and potentially lean to a, a permanent role. And then the other internship is what we call a TMO, uh, a technical machine operator. So we are now uh, getting into fairly complex machines. Um, so they require um, engineers now. And so that might be one that leans quite nicely towards your skill set. So feel free to come and look for me after. Um, from the Rwandan standpoint, Rwanda is very protective of Rwandans. Um, and so um, starting a business, I'm a foreigner, I'm American. Um, we're given two, two visas for foreigners um, and encouraged to hire from within Rwanda, train within Rwanda. Um, so unfortunately, not a lot of opportunity our side. Um, our focus is more on training up young Rwandans. Um, so we have um, a few interns, you know, a third of our company right now is interns um, because people want to get involved in this industry, but it's very hard because if you get an internship with one of the giant breweries, you don't really necessarily get all aspects. You don't get involved as deeply. So we've, we've had lots of requests and, and we're hoping to turn Quasa into more of an incubator program. You know, a rising tide raises all boats. You know, the more people we can get into the industry, I think the better off we all are. Um, so we're doing that internally in Rwanda, and I think each of us kind of, in our own ways, finds ways to, to get people into the industry. Thank you. Um, so one of my passions is skills development. Um, I actually mentor a lot of young women um, in the industry, outside of South Africa as well. So if there's anyone that uh, is already in the industry or wants to get in, I do avail my time for such things. I actually, I uh, don't know if anyone knows that we actually do not have a brewing school in the continent. Um, if you want to become a brewer, qualified brewer, you have to either go to the US or Europe to study. So uh, my other company, I'm about to change that. We I'm actually um, have a brewing school starting up in South Africa, which uh, with time will hopefully grow to the rest of the continent um, and be able to actually upskill people wherever they are so that they can then be employed in the breweries in those regions. And as more the industry grows, the more breweries we get, they're gonna need people to employ in each region. So I don't think it's necessary from someone from Kenya to travel all the way to South Africa to become a brewer where there are breweries in Kenya already. And I think it's up to us to start growing the industry in each region. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have internships, and um, we, we're we getting there with upcountry. Uh, it's, uh, our beers need to be kept refrigerated all the time, and they only have a three-month shelf life, so it's, it's hard to, like, ship uh, a bunch of beer, you know, to, like, Kakamega, and then uh, if it's not being activated, uh, you have to take it back. So we're, we're, at this stage, we're really focused on Nairobi, but... Uh, if you want 254 beer anywhere in Kenya, we hook you up, don't worry. Actually, Owen has employed one of our former students. Is it one or two? Se uh, several, eh? A few, I think. Yeah, several students from the universities. Young people, I went over there, they are making uh, IPAs. They gave me some samples. They got a restaurant over there. He, he's, um, he, and thank you for doing that. That's, uh, we, we, that's, we really need employment here. Very so. talented students. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that sums it up. Uh, I want to thank my panelists for actually creating time. These people have flown to this place. Others have taken time off their very busy schedules to be here. We are really glad for you to have been able to make it. Mm -hmm.